Just a moment, Senator Henderson. I'm not sure the mic is working. Just try it again. Uh, no, just one, two. Oh, there was a little button that was not on. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I rise in this adjournment debate to recognise the importance of the proposed Foreign Relations Bill, the details of which were announced last Thursday by the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Senator Payne. This is indeed groundbreaking legislation. The bill ensures that all arrangements that states, territories, councils and universities have with a foreign government are consistent with Australian foreign policy. The bill will safeguard Australia's national sovereign interests from any such arrangement which seeks to undermine Australia's foreign policy and national interests. It is, of course, imperative that our nation speaks with one voice, consistent with our national sovereignty, our values, our foreign policy and our national interests. Our constitution provides that it is the federal government which has responsibility for foreign policy. And yet there is no legislative requirement that a state or territory, local council or university must consult with the federal government before entering into any sort of arrangement or agreement with a foreign government. The Foreign Relations Bill gives the Foreign Minister the power to terminate an existing arrangement or prohibit a proposed arrangement which is not in accordance with Australia's national interests or our values. The proposed scheme establishes an approval regime and a notification regime. Under the approval regime, state and territory governments will be prohibited from entering into arrangements with foreign governments unless the Foreign Minister has given approval. Under the notification regime, states and territories, local governments and other state entities, such as universities established by state or territory legislation, must notify the Foreign Minister before entering into an arrangement with foreign entities. This includes an arrangement between a local government in Australia and a provincial government in a foreign country. If deemed necessary, the Foreign Minister will be able to prevent negotiations or finalisation of an arrangement or require the termination or variation of an existing agreement. We will also establish a public register to make these arrangements transparent. This will feature information about the arrangements and decisions made by the Foreign Minister. This new law will cover not just legally binding arrangements under Australian and foreign law, but non-legally binding arrangements such as memorandums of understanding. Commercial corporations, whether private or state-owned, are not covered by this bill. And foreign universities are also not covered by this law unless those foreign universities are arms of a foreign government. And a good example of that is a government military university. In applying the test, the foreign minister will ask, is the arrangement likely to or does it adversely affect Australia's foreign relations? And is the arrangement likely to be or is it inconsistent with Australian foreign policy. Within six months of the bill being enacted, states and territories, local councils and public universities will have to complete a stock take and notify the Commonwealth of their existing arrangements with foreign governments. As I mentioned, this is groundbreaking legislation. Uh, this will shine a very important light on a number of arrangements about which our government currently has no knowledge. This will make states and territories, local governments and universities accountable. An initial limited stock take of existing arrangements uh, has revealed that these arrangements will broadly cover uh, the following subjects, cultural cooperation, education, environmental management, 
health cooperation, infrastructure, public sector cooperation, science cooperation, sister city-state relationships, tourism cooperation and trade and economic cooperation. I think it's very important to point out that this is not about excessive intrusion into the business of states and territories. Um, this law is designed to give the Australian people confidence in relation to the arrangements entered into by the states and territories, by local government and by universities. And what is, of course, also very important is that subsidiary arrangements entered into under the auspices of a non-approved arrangement, such as a construction contract or an infrastructure agreement, depending on their legal status, may also be invalidated or required to be terminated. It is, of course, regrettable that this sort of law is necessary. But some recent agreements entered into between some universities, Australian universities and foreign states, have given rise to some deep concerns that such arrangements are not in the national interest and therefore this bill, this new law, is essential. Of course, perhaps the most concerning agreement of all, one, of which, one about which I have spoken out very strongly, is Victoria's Belt and Road Initiative Agreement. As I have said consistently over many months, it defies belief that Premier Daniel Andrews thought this was a good idea. The Chinese Communist Party's objective through its Belt and Road program is to exert influence and dependency in the arrangements it seeks to make with other nations. Premier Andrews' agreement with China's National Development and Reform Commission focuses on infrastructure, innovation and trade development and market access. And this agreement follows an, a, an agreement or a memorandum of understanding which Victoria entered into with China um, on the BRI in 2018. As the Australian Strategic Policy Institute has made very clear, and I might say, as Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton and then the Prime Minister self, uh, himself has made clear, uh, the BRI is not in Australia's national interest. ASPE says that the BRI is a strategic path to assert China's growing power. And while the Victorian government planned to involve Chinese companies in Victoria's so-called $107 billion infrastructure big build, uh, there is no doubt that this is at the expense of Victorian jobs and the interests of Australian companies. But much more than that, as ASPE makes very, makes very clear, this would involve the Victorian government signing up to bring a whole set of Chinese communications control and collection technologies along with the so-called big build. And this may therefore present prima facie a concern to our national interest and potentially to our national security interests. The bottom line, Mr President, is that the Morrison government takes the threat of foreign interference and influence very, very seriously, and we are taking a broad range of actions to protect Australia's interests. This groundbreaking legislation makes it very clear that this nation, when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to our national interest, will continue to speak with one voice. In recent years, we have done an incredible amount of work to combat foreign interference and foreign influence, including the Espionage and Foreign Interference Act, the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme and the new electoral funding and disclosure reforms. And today, I was very pleased that following a reference from Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security will hold an inquiry into foreign interference in Australian universities. The inquiry will not only examine universities but all publicly funded research and grants and the extent to which intellectual property and knowledge is being transferred to foreign powers in a manner that is contrary to our national interests. So I commend the Morrison government on implementing 
of this very important law, the Foreign Relations Bill, which will tell all countries that we stand in Australia's interests only, whether it's protecting our national interest or our national security interest. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Senator Watt. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. President. Uh, rise to tonight to cover two important issues uh, that I think are worthy of some attention. Um, the first is the tabling today of the interim observations from the Royal Commission into Natural Disaster Arrangements, better known as the Bushfires Royal Commission. Uh, and in its introduction, uh, the Royal Commission interim observations notes uh, the unprecedented nature of the bushfires which Australia saw in so many parts of the country in the summer just gone. Uh, of course, we tragically saw 33 lives lost, uh, over 3,000 homes destroyed. It's now estimated about 3 billion animals in Australia uh, being killed or displaced from those fires, and of course millions of hectares burned, including World Heritage listed national parks. When we look back on those bushfires, I think all of us remember with great shock how poorly prepared this government was for last year's bushfires. And today's interim observations uh, from the Royal Commission demonstrate some very major shortcomings in this government's approach to handling those bushfires last year. They are on the interim observations. Uh, final recommendations will be made when the Royal Commission tables its final report in a couple of months' time. Uh, but in the meantime, there are some very important observations that the Royal Commission has made and that I certainly hope that the Prime Minister and his government take on board. Uh, we all remember uh, the, the terrible response we saw from the Prime Minister uh, after the last bushfires, not being in the country, refusing to take responsibility, telling people that he didn't hold a hose, mate, and I have to say some of the same abrogation of responsibility that we've continued to see from this Prime Minister now in relation to the aged care crisis. Unless if there's a photo op involved, he doesn't want to be there, he doesn't want to take responsibility, and we saw that over and over again in the bushfires last year. As I say, this interim report uh, makes clear that there is a lack of national coordination between the, Commonwealth's, the, state, the Commonwealth, the states and territories in relation to natural disasters, with the inquiry finding that current arrangements quote, might not be suitable to facilitate national decisions. The Royal Commission uh, has found that Australia is likely to experience more frequent and intense natural disasters due to climate change, with a growing risk that disasters will become too great for one state or territory to manage alone. Sadly, our ability to prepare for and respond to natural disasters in this country remains impaired by a government that has too many people who want to deny the existence of climate change and the impact that it is having on the world around us, including the fact that we are likely to see more frequent and intense natural disasters. I truly do hope that the government can overcome its own divisions on climate change so that we can put in place the measures required to keep Australians safe from these sorts of disasters into the future. The Royal Commission has found that many recommendations from 20 years of natural disaster inquiries quote, have not yet been adequately implemented. It also found that confusion, gaps and inconsistent technology and procedures plagued information sharing, evacuation planning and essential infrastructure. It found that aerial firefighting capability must be reviewed in order to meet current needs. And it said that simplifying Australia's confusing bushfire warning system quote, has taken far too long and should be finished as a priority. And finally, it found that fragmented recovery efforts meant that bushfire victims were forced to repeatedly retell their story and register for services in the aftermath of the fires. Now, I welcome what the Royal Commission has had to say, and I look very much forward to seeing what its final recommendations will be, uh, because the fact that it was able to find just those things in only its interim findings shows us that we have a long way to go in making sure that the government is up to scratch when it comes to planning for, responding to and recovering from natural disasters. We, if there's one message uh, that I want to give the government, uh, having received this report today, it's that they just cannot afford to repeat the failings that we saw last year. 
They failed to prepare for the bushfires last year. The Prime Minister refused to even take meetings with people who wanted to give him advice about how to avoid the worst of those fire conditions, and we saw the consequences from that. I truly hope that the government listens to what the Royal Commission is saying and that it doesn't fail to prepare in the way that it did last year. Just today, we saw the outlook uh, through spring for bushfires uh, issued by the peak body, the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Research Centre. And they've indicated that while overall the fire conditions we face this spring aren't as severe as what we faced this time last year, there is still an above average fire risk in significant parts of the country, particularly in my home state of Queensland. So this is a, this is a, uh, a threat that we will continue to face into the future. Uh, in addition to other threats, uh, other natural disaster threats such as floods and cyclones, and there are already worrying signs that the government is not preparing adequately for the coming disaster season. We worked with the government to pass legislation about 18 months ago to establish a new emergency response fund to set up a fund. Uh, with $200 million a year available to be spent on disaster recovery and mitigation. We have already seen one financial year pass with not a single cent spent from that emergency response fund. So there was money available there that could have been used for disaster mitigation, whether it be building flood levees, bushfire fire breaks, evacuation centres, all sorts of things that could come in very handy this coming disaster season, and the government has failed to spend that money available. Again, it's an instance of this government being more concerned with making an announcement rather than actually following through and delivering on what it promises that it will do. So, as I say, let's hope that the government does take these interim observations seriously and gets its act together and makes sure that we're a lot better prepared for the coming fire season than we were last year. The other matter that I want to turn to uh, tonight is a vote that occurred earlier today in the Senate regarding a motion that I moved, along with Queensland Labor senators, to try to shore up the rights of mining workers in my home state of Queensland. And I'm very pleased that Senator Canavan is here to hear about this, because he certainly wasn't in the chamber Order. when the matter was being debated earlier today. So today, with this Senate motion, Senator Canavan and his Queensland LNP colleagues they failed the test. They failed the test that they have tried to set for Labor repeatedly to measure our support for coal miners in the state of Queensland. Now, we've all heard Senator Canavan and his colleagues over many years now try to set themselves up as the friend of coal miners. Senator Canavan even goes far as getting out there and trying to dress up like a coal miner in order to, to hoodwink miners into thinking that he's on their side. Well, today he showed his true colours. Today, Senator Canavan and his LNP colleagues from Queensland showed once and for all that when they say they like mining, what they really mean is that they like mining bosses and that they don't support mining workers. The motion that we moved today called on the government to withdraw its support from a High Court case that it, is, it has joined that seeks to enshrine forever the rort that big mining companies and labour hire firms use to employ full-time, long-term coal miners as permanent casuals. Now, Senator Canavan, when he goes to the mines, he doesn't like to go and meet actual mining workers, and he certainly doesn't like to go and meet casuals. He just prefers to dress up as one and get lots of photos taken with him while he goes off and meets the boss. But I've met those mining workers. I've met them in Moorambar. I've met them in Middlemount. I've met them in Thierry. I've met them in Rockhampton, and I've met them in Gladstone. And these are people who are engaged as casuals by labour hire firms and employed to do the same work week after week, year after year. Now, in every other thing but the way they are classified by their boss, they are permanent workers. But because they're employed as casuals, they don't get the job security of permanent workers, they don't get the leave entitlements of permanent workers, and they don't get any of the other benefits that the permanent workers they work with get. And this is a situation that Senator Canavan and the Queensland LNP are happy to see continue. And that's why they've joined with Workpack a labour hire firm in their High Court appeal to try to keep this permanent casual rort in place. It is not good enough. If you're going to be in central Queensland, like Senator Canavan, try and dress up like a miner and tell miners that you care about them and that you're on their side, you could at least have the decency, when you come down to Canberra, to vote with Labor to try and get this government to back off the permanent casual Order. rort. 
I know he doesn't want to hear it, and I know that he's embarrassed because he likes to dress up as a minor, but he doesn't like to vote for minors. Can it, Senator Canavan is all about the dress-ups. He's not actually about delivering the results to the minors. He just likes to put on a dirty shirt and pretend that he's a minor, and then he likes to come down here, fly down to Canberra, and vote with the mining bosses and vote with the Liberals who want to do over those mine workers that he says that he cares about. Senator Canavan's actions and the Queensland LNP's actions today were absolutely gutless. They were absolutely gutless because they weren't prepared to back Labor and take on the big mining companies for this, this permanent casual rort. Well, we're on to you. We're not going to let you say one thing in Queensland and another thing down here. We're going to hold Order. you to Senator account. Watt, I, I will let that sentence go. I just urge senators to keep in mind personal reflections. Collective reflections on parties are one matter. Personal reflections on the attributes of senators um, are, may cross the line. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise tonight to talk about our continued failure of mutual obligations and the program of support. I was very disappointed to see the government reintroduce mutual obligations at the beginning of August. During a time of heightened uncertainty and continued lockdowns, it is an ideal time um, to take a new approach. Um, to kick the habit of the punitive approach to our social security system. The in reintroduction of mutual obligations means that people who don't accept or start a suitable in inverted commas, job will have their income support payments cancelled or suspended. According to the department's website, suitable work includes any kind of work that the person is capable of doing. It doesn't include work that someone actually wants to do or is qualified to do. From August, unemployed workers have been required to participate in at least one appointment with their provider, agree to a job plan, undertake four job searches a month and participate in activities. However, your payment won't be suspended or cancelled if you don't undertake these mutual obligations. They, in, in to rolling into the future, they will start uh, being penalised for not um, doing those things. And I've also had a lot of people tell me that they've just been forced to um, sign a job plan that once again isn't tailored to their needs. While Victorians can't be financially penal penalised for failing to accept suitable work, they have still been expected to undertake mutual obligations throughout stage four lockdowns. So on top of the 420,000 Melburnians who will receive cuts to their job seeker payment in September, they are also expected to juggle mutual obligations during lockdowns and curfews. It is clear to me that the government plans to fully reintroduce the targeted compliance framework over the coming months. This is the least effective and most punitive part of our employment services system. With the job active caseload more than doubling to 1.4 million um, people since COVID started, more people than ever before are now experiencing the predatory behaviour of, employment, of some employment service providers. My office, my office hears from people every week who have been experiencing the aggressive, predatory and dishonest behaviour coming from providers. Here are just, just some of the complaints I've heard recently. Multiple people are being chased down for pay slips, even if they have found their job without the assistance of employment service providers, just so the provider can claim their outcome bonus. Young people are being forced to undertake unpaid trials for weeks on end and told insurance isn't covered by their employer. Providers asking people to go to face-to-face -face job appointments during Melbourne Stage 4 lockdown and people being asked repeatedly to sign job plans that they haven't seen before, don't agree to and don't, aren't tailored for their needs. The Department of Employment has told us they've received only three complaints about allegations of aggressive or predatory behaviour by provider staff between March and July. This is completely out of step with what I'm hearing on a weekly and daily basis. I would strongly encourage anyone having an issue with their provider to lodge an official complaint through the National Consumer Service Line. It's time the government knew exactly what providers are up to and how badly they are treating people. The privatisation of employment service providers in the late 90s means that the provision of unemployment services have been increasingly muddied um, by the profit margin. It has become so clear that this system is flawed and not fit for purpose, particularly during this uh, pandemic and recession. The government has been forced to increase payments to providers and provide additional flexibility in how these payments are used. It is estimated that, that an additional $500 million has been provided to job agencies during COVID-19. 
This is because the job active system, which is geared towards achieving outcomes, simply can't operate properly during a recession when jobs are so hard to find. As Rick Morton explained in the Saturday paper this weekend, ide ideologically at least the federal government cannot afford for the privatised network of employment service providers operating, operating under job active to fall over, especially with the return of mutual obligations, a process that has that has already begun in stages. I think that the pandemic and um, the recession actually should make the government change their tack. It's an ideal opportunity to look at the changing the way we do business when we're providing employment services. We should be moving from a compliance punitive-based approach, which assumes that people aren't going to do the right thing, to a tailored, individualised support system, a much more supportive program where people don't feel demonised, where people aren't punished um, for, in many, many cases, as is evident under the targeted compliance framework, for mistakes, in fact, that have been made by others, not by themselves. Another part of the employment services system that is not working is the program of support. This is a program delivered by, by employment service providers for people who don't score 20 points or more in one of the impairment tables when they apply for the disability support pension. You need to have actively participated in a program of support for at least 18 months out of 36 months before you apply for the disability support pension. People who are forced to complete a program of support often have significant disabilities and medical conditions across multiple tables. Just because they don't meet 20 points in one impairment table doesn't mean that they are able to look for work. If you need time off from your program of support because of your disabilities, it doesn't count as time towards your what's commonly called POS or your program of support. My office helps people all the time who have been caught out by the program of support. They are distressed and frustrated and need advice about how they can meet their complex eligibility requirements. They are often being given the wrong information about their responsibilities and are tossed back and forth between Centrelink and their employment service providers. They don't know that having a medical exemption from their mutual obligations under, under the job seeker payment doesn't count an exemption for your program of support requirements. Some providers have even turned people away because they aren't able to assist people with their level of disability. How are people meant to get help when they are blocked every step of the way and pinged backwards and forwards between Centrelink and their job service providers? Often the job service providers don't know the rules. And who pays? Who cops it? The person with the disability. There are a lot of people who are very sick and unable to complete a program of support. They get chained around by the system and end up staying on JobSeeker um, with rolling medical exemptions when they have a disability. The reality is that these people should really be on DSP. We should be assessing their disability when they apply for income support, not assessing their, not assessing their capacity to work. The program of support has to end. It acts as a barrier, barrier to disabled people successfully claiming the DSP and must Go. During a time of uncertainty, the government is focused on the wrong things. We should be focusing on helping people through this crisis, providing tailored supports and engaging with people on an individual basis to help them into long-term fulfilling careers. It is clear we need a new employment system based on transparent, assist, transparent assistance to unemployed people that is supportive that takes a caring approach and matches people with work properly. I'm deeply concerned that, particularly given the, um, the different impacts that the crisis is having on people looking for work, young people, women and particularly older people, that the system is not adequately tailored to help those people find work. You simply can't get a job if the jobs aren't there. With so many people looking for work, bringing in the next phase of mutual obligations is going to harm people, not help people. Putting people through the targeted compliance framework, which is flawed in the first place, will deeply traumatise many people, could lead to many people 
um, either being penalised out of the system or, in fact, dropping out of the system, which is what the evidence shows has been happening. Before the pandemic, people were going missing, out, dropping out of the system with no visible means of support. The program is a flawed approach. It needs to be reformed. Take this opportunity to reform this program so people genuinely get help and we get value for the billions and billions of dollars that we spend on the Job Active program. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, tonight I want to speak about a topic I'm not a personal expert in. I don't have personal knowledge of. I, I have never vaped in my life, but I have become, I've come to uh, defend the interests of those who do have to vape, and uh, and do believe we should seek to have a legal and regulated market to, uh, for vaping in this country. I, I should put on the record I did smoke for for the last year at, at my last year at uni, and, and my first few years working in this place. But thankfully, I've not smoked for a number of years, uh, and I do. Uh, thank my wonderful wife, who always encourages me not to do it. Because I want to state at the beginning here tonight that I don't think it's right for anyone. I don't want to encourage anyone uh, to take up nicotine. It's a terrible thing to become addicted to something like nicotine. Uh, the best outcome would be for, for, for none of us to have to resort to smokes or vapes or, or other types of drugs. Uh, it's not something to aspire to. But I do know a number of good people who do vape, uh, Mr. President, and uh, and do so because. They do it in preference to the alternative of smoking. So when in late June the Minister for Health this year uh, announced that there would be a ban on the importation of vaping liquids, some of my friends contacted me, concerned that that would lead them back to vapes. I agreed that there was a concern and it did seem heavy-handed, so I started a petition with Mr George Christensen, the member for Dawson, to try to overturn the ban. Little did we realise the reaction that that would generate. I was gobsmacked with the response. In three days, uh, we had more than 70,000 people sign the petition. In the end, myself and uh, 27 other members of the Liberal National Party room wrote to the uh, Minister for Health asking him to reconsider. And many people, many people, I want to thank the many people who emailed me, uh, post online their story. I, I want to particularly thank the very engaged Aussie Vapors community on Reddit uh, uh, who rallied together to fight the ban. It was these thousands of personal stories that, that impacted me most, and I think it's those that, that uh, did the most to help overturn the, or immediately overturn the ban and, and defer it for, for six months uh, while further uh, consultation can occur. I do thank the Minister Greg Hunt uh, for listening to these people, and I do look forward to further discussions about how we can find a way forward. Um, after the action we received through these comments, I affirmed in my views that we should not proceed with a ban on the importation of vaping liquids. We should instead, in should instead legalise and regulate e-cigarette use so average Australians can help kick the habit, improve their health and live a longer and more fulfilling life with their families. And I just want to use this opportunity to read at least one uh, 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 story that was sent to me from a, from a young mum who told me that I'm a, young, I'm a mum of two young boys. I managed to successfully quit before the first uh, on, on Champix, a type of e-cigarette. I took it up again in between baby one and two, that smokes, gave up for baby number two using uh, nicotine replacement therapy. And when I was starting again almost four years ago, I decided to try a vape and I have not looked back. My lungs are better. I'm not puffed out walking up the stairs or going for a brisk walk or jog. I don't have heart palpitations and I don't have to hug my kids reeking of darts. Once upon a time, I figured I was here for a good time, not a long time. Now I've got my bubs and I want to be here for a long time. I've converted countless others off the darts and onto e-cigs who are feeling so much better as well. I could spend the whole time this evening, Mr President, reading stories like that, but I don't want to give the impression that, that my views or my conclusions are based on anecdotal evidence alone. The UK government concluded in March this year that smokers should be encouraged to use e-cigarettes because they can, and I quote, greatly increase their chances of successfully stopping smoking. A recent study by Cancer Research UK found that e-cigarettes had helped more than 50,000 smokers in the UK quit in 2017. As I said before, the best health outcome is for people not to smoke tobacco or e-cigarettes at all, but the UK Royal College of Physicians has concluded that the health risks of e-cigarettes are unlikely to exceed 5 per cent of those associated with smoking tobacco. Last month, Australian data helped support many of these findings. Every three years, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare conducts a national drug household survey. The latest results showed the good news that 127,000 fewer Australians are smoking 
than three years, three years prior. That almost exactly matches the 130,000 extra Australians that are now using uh, less harmful e-cigarettes on a daily basis. Now, not everyone that has given up smoking has reverted to an e-cigarette, but almost, according to this data, almost 90 per cent of those that use e-cigarettes daily have previously been smokers. The statistical evidence now clearly shows that e-cigarettes can help cut smoking rates, which is why every developed country in the world, except for us, except for Australia and Turkey, has legalised their use. Why do we hold out? The most common reason given is that vaping could be an on-ramp, encouraging some people to take up smoking. Again, the data does not back this up. Just 1 per cent of current smokers tried an e-cigarette before they tried a real cigarette. This is based on that Australian Institute of Health and Welfare study, uh, a, a very extensive survey, and just 1 per cent of those who currently smoke actually tried an e-cigarette before they tried a real cigarette. So it's not a round ramp. It's clearly not an on ramp. In the Australian government's own evidence, it's not an on ramp. E-cigarettes are a gateway to get off smokes, not to get hooked on them. Another concern is that e-cigarettes may be more attractive to children. But more children, according to this data, more children aged between the age of 14 and 17 have tried other illicit drugs, such as marijuana and ecstasy, than have tried e-cigarettes. In any case, if we regulated the e-cigarette market, we could concentrate on keeping them away from kids rather than wasting resources on trying to ban them all. And I fully support making sure uh, that we regulate any e-cigarette market so that we avoid the marketing of products to young children, we avoid trying to design products that attract young children. Those things should be extensive in any uh, regulation on e-cigarettes in this country. Another issue is a recent spate of lung diseases and deaths in the US associated with people vaping cannabis-derived THC oil and vitamin E acetate. Some US states have, in effect, an unregulated market on these products, and I'm not a proposing, and I don't know anyone who is proposing, such a model here for this country. Dangerous vaping liquids should be banned. Again, we should concentrate our enforcement efforts on the real harm, not try to nanny adults who can make their own decisions. I want to return back to that person who, who told me their story about their young children and their efforts to get off smoking. She also said, she also said to me that I find it flabbergasting, flabbergasting that I can grab a packet of cancer sticks at every corner store, but I'm a criminal for bringing in nicotine li liquids. And I couldn't say that better myself. Why can you go to a servo and pick up a bunch of smokes, but you can't, you can't, uh, it's absolutely illegal to buy a less harmful nicotine delivery system in this country. That is something I think that must change. Smoking continues to be the drug that kills more Australians than any other, by far. Uh, by far. In that same Australian Institute and Health and Welfare report, it showed that 20,000 Australians annually die from the effects of smoking. Uh, that's compared to 6,000 from alcohol and 2,500 and from illicit drugs. We should continue to try and reduce the rate of smoking in this country, especially because those, the impacts of those, of those smoking habits are especially felt in remote and Indigenous communities around Australia. The evidence is clear. The overseas evidence has come in that vaping products and e-cigarettes can help cut smoking rates, can help us avoid some, some of this terrible harm that inflicts those who become addicted uh, to smoking. So we should continue to push for that reduction in smoking because of the harm it causes and, in my view, a legal and regulated e-cigarette market offers the best hope to achieve that. Thank you, Senator Canavan. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.